From WFIU in Bloomington, Indiana, this is Earth Eats, and I'm your host, Kate Young. I just wanted to provide context for folks because I do think that the conversation around plant-based food for the last eight years or so has been pushed toward a more corporate, vertical, lab meat, impossible burgers, beyond burgers, meat substitutes that act like meat and look like meat, and has gotten really far away from whole foods and vegetables and and legumes and just how nice it is to just eat some beans sometimes. (laughs) This week on the show, we talk with food writer Alicia Kennedy about her new book, No Meat Required, The Cultural History and Culinary Future of Plant-Based Eating. Stay with us. Thanks for listening to Earth Eats. I'm Kate Young. And I guess I would describe myself as a mostly vegetarian. I'm not opposed to eating animals per se, but I personally can't enjoy meat if I start thinking about factory farming. So I tend to avoid meat unless I know for sure that the animal has spent most of its life walking around outside doing animal things. That means the meat I purchase comes from small, usually local farms, and it's higher priced, which means I eat less of it, which is fine with me. I love vegetarian food. I've been enjoying what is now called a plant-based diet for most of my adult life. I've never been drawn to vegetarian foods that mimic meat too closely. I like beans and grains, some tofu, vegetables and cheeses. I'd never make it as a vegan. I've yet to try an Impossible Burger, and I cannot wrap my mind around lab-grown meat. My guest today has been thinking a lot about these things. Alicia Kennedy is a food writer from New York, currently based in Puerto Rico, and her new book is called No Meat Required, The Cultural History and Culinary Future of Plant-Based Eating. Here's my conversation with Alicia Kennedy, which took place in late July 2023, just before her book release in August. I would like to start our conversation today with a bit about your story and just hearing more about how did you find your way into the world of food and into the world of food writing. I had always wanted to be a writer. I studied English at Fordham University in New York City, and then I was working at New York Magazine. I got a job not not so soon out of college, but a couple of years out of college as a copy editor there on the digital side. So I had been working as a copy editor. I had always loved to eat, but I never really got into food and into cooking until I started to have a sort of epiphany or consciousness raising moment around eating meat and wanting to stop eating meat. It had been something I had dabbled with my whole life, had been kind of interested in doing my whole life, but until I was in my early mid 20s with a job and it was I wasn't something I was able to kind of take control of in a real way and so when I finally had that opportunity I gave up meat and that was when I started to cook I started to bake baking was a way that really opened my eyes to ingredient sourcing to problems of farm worker rights in places like where bananas grow, where sugar grows, where chocolate grows, and trying to do my best with those things. Starting to learn about local grains, especially in New York State, and trying to source things from mills that were were local and using local grain and that sort of thing. And so my, my consciousness around food formed through baking and through giving up meat and through being vegan, first first of all. And seeing how my ethics and beliefs around those things also were influencing my interest in, in you know, sustainable and equitable sourcing as well. And you also had a bakery, like you ran a bakery. Well, it wasn't a brick and mortar bakery. I sold at farmers markets and at natural grocers and that sort of thing. I got into a commissary kitchen for a while. That also taught me a lot about the food business and and margins and the absolute 
difficulties of sourcing ingredients well and equitably and then selling them at a price point that people will actually buy them and never actually paid myself ever. So it, it was a, a real learning experience in terms of the food industry and what it actually means to run a small business. Well, I would imagine that experience probably informs your writing and your approach to talking Absolutely. to people about their food businesses. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so you have been working as a freelance writer. I know you've also been on staff at publications, but your work has appeared in many places, in Bon Appetit, in Harper's Bazaar, Eater, Wine Enthusiast, and many other places. And your newsletter from the desk of Alicia Kennedy has more than 25,000 subscribers. And you've steadily built a career that I find truly inspiring. And on your about page on your website, there's a photo of you leaning forward in black shorts and chunky heels with like a 35 millimeter camera in your hand, covering half your face, pointed at a long mirror. And to me, I just feel like this photo says so much about your work and your approach. It's just like you even do your own photo shoots, you know, (laughs) like it's just sort of... (laughs) captures that spirit of of your career. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how this has been for you, building this kind of career in food writing and and culture writing. Having been a young teenager in the late 90s, I think that that, obviously that aesthetic holds a big sway over me. But I also just saw being creative and making things as all related to each other. So just because I wanted to be a writer didn't mean that I also didn't take photos. And it didn't mean that I didn't, you know, make collages or something like that. Like all of this sort of creative energy all sprang forth from the same place, but was expressed in in different ways. And so I've always had, I guess I've been calling it, I talked to Hetty McKinnon, who's a cookbook author about this and about have both of us having a sort of DIY streak in our work where, you know, we don't really wait for other people to give us the go ahead to do things. We just do them. And I think that that's becoming all the more important. Uh, it's always obviously been an aspect of, of culture work, uh, you know, to make zines, to put out your own stuff, throw your own party. But it's really interesting right now in terms of like the so-called creator economy, where so many folks are responsible for making themselves a commodity in terms of their their creative output, whether that's them putting on little outfits and posting on TikTok, or it's someone like me who is putting out a newsletter and, and charging for subscriptions to get behind the paywall for recipes and that sort of thing. And it's an interesting double-edged sword because while I grew up and really love DIY, I think that we're at a point where it's be, we're being kind of taken advantage of in terms of how much we're expected to produce, how much attention we're su- expected to maintain in order to make a living. You know, I love being able to publish my own newsletter, but there are fewer places for me to write. So I sort of was forced into that, you know, and it's given me such great opportunities. But at the same time, I have to endlessly produce and navigate that and do the administrative work. And, you know, I had to hire an accountant to deal with it. And like, it's, it's, it's a lot of stuff on top of everything. And and it's, it's, it's more than a full time job, really, because everything around you constantly that whether you're doing it, or you're seeing it, or you're being it is is potential content it's potential essay or it's a potential video it's a potential photo it's something to get attention and continue to keep the money coming in and that just never ever stops and so it it's it's interesting because i think i would have always been a person who takes the reins and and just you know does their own photos and publishes themselves and that sort of thing but at the same time it's become such a requirement in a negative way. And with social media, of course, like you just the the necessity of maintaining people's gaze all the time is is just relentless. So it's an interesting space to be in. <laughs> yeah, I, what you said about it's more than a full time job that like anytime there's food involved, you're probably questioning, oh, should I be 
doing something with this? Or can yes, I just enjoy yes. this meal right now? You know? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I mean, it's, it's a dream. And there, now, you know, so many young people want to be influencers, which I never wanted to be an influencer. I just wanted to be a writer. But at the same time, now you, you kind of have to do, do all of it. So you also have a podcast called Meatless. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and what a podcast allows you to do. Well, I started the podcast in 2018 as kind of in the hopes of selling this book, which the working title had been Meatless. So I wanted to interview folks in food and in culture about their relationship to meat and to eating and cooking in general and where it intersected with their other commitments, whether that was, you know, aesthetic or political or spiritual. And it it was really interesting and it provided a lot of the basis of analysis for the book. And so I guess I've, I've done over probably 100 something episodes of of this podcast, but I've done it intermittently over time. And now it it lives in the newsletter. And I put put out one episode per month with specifically talking to cookbook authors, because my current obsession is how how to navigate sort of domestic labor when your your job is recipe development, and how we navigate the tension of cooking for ourselves and cooking for work and and cooking for people and or in our families or our friends and that sort of thing and how how we kind of approach those things so that that's my current obsession so i i I think i use the podcast as an excuse to interview people about things I'm thinking about. (laughs) So it's very, very selfish in that way. But it's been very useful and and really, really helps me to think through things that I can't navigate completely on my own. And I also think it's a huge boon to my audience too to, you know, find out about other people's work and understand which cookbooks they want to buy right now, especially, and that sort of thing. Because I'm, I'm not a person who cooks a lot directly out of cookbooks and so I'm not a person who's going you're not going to come to me for like a cookbook review like I made this dish and this dish and this dish but I do want to talk about the ideas that go into how someone approaches recipe development because to me that's that's kind of a bit more interesting. As my next question I wanted to ask you about recipe development I know that you were here on the IU campus talking about recipe development and you did a, a workshop with the IU Food Institute. Could you talk about what that process looks like and is it something that like is it something that you do at home and it sounds like it is yes yes 100 percent. like for me when i've tried to do recipe development sort of separate from my home cooking it has been really tedious and (laughs) wasteful honestly and also you know very just it it's a it's much harder work and so you know when someone does set out to do a cookbook, that is a lot of work. That's so much labor because you have to figure out what you're doing with all of this food. You you have to figure out how to store all of this stuff. Like most recipe developers are working from home. There's the lucky few who are in a test kitchen. It's something you have to navigate kind of aside from your daily cooking when when working on a on a bigger project. And For me, like with when I write the recipes for my newsletter or if a magazine commissions a recipe for me, I always try and have it fit into the flow of what my daily cooking is. And, you know, recently I had a bunch of mint and cilantro around and I decided to blend it into a sauce with, you know, just some garlic and onion and a little spices. And I was like, oh, this is really good. I'll write a recipe for this. So then I, I just did it again later and actually took down the measurements but it has to be something i really really want to eat and i think this is what most recipe developers will tell you and i found out is their recipes are governed by what they want to eat mine are also governed by what is like really overproducing here in puerto rico like i have so many lemons right now so i'm trying to develop a new lemon cake and trying to figure out how to make it interesting because i've done so many like citrus cakes in in my life But I think that's also kind of the challenge of being a more seasonal cook is you have to learn how to deal with that overproduction and and figure out many different ways to navigate it. I mean, it's summer, so now everyone is like dealing with zucchini. And and so I'm sure there's going to be a, you know, it's the season to go look for zucchini recipes. And it's like, what, what new thing can we possibly really do with zucchini 
do we just need to be reminded of the old things we know already how to do with zucchini? Coming to recipe development from that perspective now, I mean, I'm never going to be the recipe developer that people come to to give them new weeknight meals or something like that. I can give you ideas for how to think through what your weeknight meals should be based on what you like and how your pantry functions and maybe how to deal with seasonal gluts of, you know, watery vegetables like like a zucchini or with citrus or with eggplant, depending on what's around. For me, recipe development is is more of an extension of thinking about food system problems than it is about how do I tell people to make the most delicious thing? Because I I, I don't believe every recipe has been written already. But I think we've done a pretty good job. <laughs> and I think what people need help with a lot of the time is thinking through the kitchen for themselves, how to navigate it to their own taste. Because I feel like a lot of people have just been alienated from cooking and, ki and the kitchen and just need that push to figure out how to build the things they want to eat every day and, and what how to build a kitchen that will kind of nudge them toward having a happy existence around food every day. Yeah, sort of support their own lifestyle right. and tastes and time and so yeah. forth. Yeah. <laughs> like I had a lot of mint and cilantro. Maybe you have a ton of dill and scallions, but kind of this, you know, the same concepts apply. I'm speaking with food writer Alicia Kennedy. After a short break, we'll talk about her new book, No Meat Required. Stay with us. Kate Young here. This is Earth Eats. Let's return to my conversation with food writer Alicia Kennedy. You have a new book released August 2023 with Beacon Press, and your book is called No Meat Required, The Cultural History and Culinary Future of Plant-Based Eating. Can you talk about what drove you to write this book and what you felt like was missing from the conversation that you could speak to? Well, I think I'd been in my career as, you know, a baker and then as a food writer, I had just been working towards this specific book the entire time. So I'd been doing this re research and doing this thinking and going down these rabbit holes for years and years. And so this book really just collects a lot of thinking that I had been doing and a lot of conversations I'd been having, all the reading I'd been doing. And I think it was a very timely moment. Right now, we're a little bit past the 50-year mark in terms of when Diet for a Small Planet came out. And I find Diet for a Small Planet by Francis LePay, which originally came out in 1971, to be such a watershed moment in terms of vegetarian and, and plant-based eating in the United States because it, it really developed a language for a secular argument for not eating meat and why, or cutting back on meat and why that would be really important for folks in an affluent nation such as the United States to use land differently, to think about distribution differently, to just kind of readjust the way we consume in order to better feed the entire world. So in those 50 years, there's been so much that has happened from that kind of secular perspective in terms of I write about, you know, eco-feminists and feminist restaurants like Bloodroot in Connecticut. I write about how the punk and anarchist movement sort of has influenced vegan cuisine as it exists today. I wrote about raw foods and, and the good that's come from raw foods and also, you know, how it gave veganism kind of this wellness health halo that that has kind of done a lot more damage than good maybe. And also like innovations in non-dairy dairy and that sort of thing. And I just wanted to provide context for folks because I do think that the conversation around plant-based food for the last I'll say eight years or so, which is truly as long as I've been writing about food, has been kind of pushed toward a more corporate, vertical, like lab meat, you know, impossible burgers, beyond burgers, like meat substitutes that act like meat and look like meat, and has gotten really far away from whole foods and vegetables and and legumes and like just how how nice it is to just eat some beans sometimes. <laughs> and so I wanted to provide that context so that because I do think that it's so easy when the dominant narrative is, of course, coming from the most moneyed corporate position that we step back and say, is this the actual narrative around the future of food that we want to put forth? Or do we want to 
kind of understand where environmentally and politically minded vegetarian and vegan thinking has been and so how we can kind of reshape it for the future and what would that food look like what have we learned from the past of vegan and vegetarian food and how to make it appealing that we can use going into the future and one of the things that's so interesting is that we really do know that the meat substitutes don't work in achieving behavior change, uh, especially for omnivores, it's not as appealing as, you know, what someone like Deborah Madison, who's now more famous as a cookbook author, but when she was the chef at Greens in San Francisco, she really changed the narrative around vegetarian food and made it really delicious and made it really vegetable focused. And that caused a huge shift. And whenever the the plant-based food gets kind of away from focusing on the vegetables, the tofu, like tofu has a different story. But, you know, when it gets away from being really recognizable to folks, that's when it kind of loses a lot of steam. And so I just wanted this book to give that context and to to provide that kind of cultural and, and culinary background that I think folks often dismiss. People dismiss vegetarian or vegan ideology as simply that as simply ideology and you know people who don't actually care about eating good food and I wanted to write a book that showed that people have actually been trying for a long time to make good food (laughs) with no animals and we've really been succeeding I think. In the book you talk about how vegetarianism and veganism how it's become more mainstream and it's lost some of the connection to its radical political roots Can we talk a little bit about some of those histories that you chronicle in the book? Just like that you just touched on a little bit, just this kind of counterculture hippies and ecofeminists and (laughs) punks. Yeah, I I think I could have called the book like hippies, feminist punks, because that's really the the trajectory (laughs) that it takes. So counterculture cuisine started in the late 60s, you know, part of the counterculture response to the Vietnam War and and other things happening in society. There were some offshoots there where people lived in communes and communes had their own cookbooks. And one of those, which is a place that still exists, is the farm in Summertown, Tennessee. And they have always been a vegan commune very focused on soy foods. Uh, They put out the farm vegetarian cookbook in in the early 70s. And you can still see some of that legacy a little bit. It's very rudimentary stuff, like using nutritional yeast for way too much, using like tofu for way too many things, like just not a lot of like thought, not a lot of technique going into it. But there was a lot of good ideas there. And then you see folks... Ecofeminism is first coined in, I believe, 1974. And this is the idea that the way we treat the planet has connections to how patriarchy regards women. And that has an extension into how we treat animals is an extension of how we treat women in terms of obviously the the use and the and the misuse of of animals in animal agriculture and so a lot of ecofeminists became vegetarian not all of them there is obviously there's always factionalism in these in these philosophies but one very very famous place that uses as its at its root the the ecofeminist philosophy is called bloodroot and it's in Bridgeport, Connecticut and it's one of the I think it's the only still operating feminist restaurant in the United States and it's still a uh, run by the same two women who opened it in the 70s Selma and Miriam and it's still a really significant touchstone for folks who are starting to understand food and its connections to feminism, to the environment, to all these places and and all these ideas. And so that is still a significant kind of ideology within plant-based eating, I think. And I think ecofeminism is having another kind of come back and and the the text that originally coined the term it was just translated from French actually for the first time. So I think we're we're seeing a, a big swing back toward that. Then you also have folks who were involved in the punk scene 
who have a more anarchist approach to political ideology. Uh, these are the folks who put out the very, very important cookbook zine, Soy Not Oi, in 1989. And other zines like Please Don't Feed the Bears, Raggedy Anarchy's like Guide to the Universe. There's just a lot of that zine culture and anarchist connection and, and punk ethos that has this approach to veganism as well. And it's, you know, it's rooted in this rejection of dominance ideologies, of hierarchy, of, you know, status quo and, and corporate control and that sort of thing. And so... It's what's interesting to me, and I think it's the punk chapter is really the one that people are talking to me about the most so far. And I think it's because it's so clear once you see it and name it. But I think for a lot of folks, it never kind of coalesced, you know, it's like you you knew people who were into punk and hardcore or something, and you knew they were straight edge and they they were vegan, but it never kind of all came together (laughs) as like, oh, there's like these kind of there's these ideological reasons for that. What's interesting about that movement is it's where we we see a lot of the most successful folks in vegan and vegetarian food in this this century, you know, like Brooks Headley, who was a drummer in in a lot of bands, became a pastry chef at Del Posto, got a lot of awards and now runs Superiority Burger in the East Village, which is like a vegetarian restaurant with lines out the door. Um, You have Lagusta Yearwood, who also worked at Bloodroot but runs, you know, this ethical chocolate shop in upstate New York and has roots in that that sort of lineage. There's Issa Chandra Moskowitz, who's written like all these famous vegan cookbooks, uh, including Veganomicon, which I think is still like still the joy of cooking for vegans. And so, you know, a lot of that ethos has has really formed the basis of how vegan cuisine has been shaped in, in this century, which is super interesting. Reading that made me dig up this little zine that I have <laughs> that's about how to make soy milk. And um, yeah, it's it's exactly the kind of thing that you're talking about. This one comes from Farm Punks International in Whitwell, Tennessee. <laughs> so, Love that. Yeah. Tennessee is a very fascinating place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all about, you know, it's 10 steps to making soy milk, you know. <laughs> yeah. So my next question about that is if plant-based eating has lost its its political kind of food justice connection, why is that important to you? And yeah, I, I'll just stop there. Why is that important to you? Well, I think it's so important because if we forget that it was important at one point to make your own tempeh or make your own soy milk and kind of let corporations own a very greenwashed version of vegan food, vegetarian food. It's just concentrating all this power and all this wealth in in folks who don't really care about food and don't really care about the land and biodiversity and are really, you know, focused on making money. It's been difficult for me to watch folks who don't eat meat and have been very, very committed to making sure folks know why it's so important to eat less meat, to consume less dairy, especially, you know, when you're living in an affluent place like the United States and have been very, very accepting of things like, you know, genetically modified soy as the basis for an impossible burger, so long as it gets a vegan burger into Burger King or despite whatever conditions fast food workers are facing, despite whatever conditions farm workers are facing for other products on that same burger. And if, we like lab meat a lot and, and want to make cell cultured meat. At what scale are we going to make it that it's not going to be wildly energy intensive and reliant on fossil fuels and not taking up a lot of space that could be go- going to better use? And so it's all the same problems of land use, concentrated power, concentrated wealth that we have seen cause so much destruction on the meat and dairy side. And so many of these companies who have gotten into the space of alternative proteins are also the same companies who are meat packers, meat processors. You know, they, they've they just put their hand and their, their money into these products and, and have been like, why not ride that wave as well? And so, you know, I think it's important to remember why eating vegetarian and eating vegan became a thing in the United States, you know, and and all these reasons that people gave 
these things up it's about rejecting these things like it's about rejecting the using land poorly it's rejecting not taking workers rights seriously in the food system it's about rejecting corporate power in food and so i i think that if people are reminded of that i hope that we can remember why like it's okay to eat beans and tofu and 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 vegetables instead of calling it a win to put beyond sausage on a domino's pizza you know i think that there's while those things have perhaps their place and their role for for someone and for some demographics and and changing behaviors in that way perhaps on a small scale i think that on a larger scale, we still have to be thinking about how to invite people to reduce consumption of meat, reduce consumption of dairy, and eat in a way that also serves our kind of need to restore biodiversity and and smaller regional food economies in, in ways that promote a food justice perspective, if that makes sense. So you're seeing some of the same issues and problems with meat production being replicated in these kind of fake meat and lab grown meat um yeah and and because it's, it's around land use it's around energy energy usage it's around labor rights it's around concentrated corporate power and it's difficult because people will argue well there will there will be fewer animals slaughtered but we just have no evidence of that we have no evidence that that's what's going to happen we have no evidence that you know what we have evidence for is that beyond me laid off a ton of employees and it's you know stopped selling as much at the end of last year same thing for impossible like the sales are very are way down and are people really going to want to switch to cellular based meats and, and that sort of thing do we know what these the nutritional repercussions are long term of these sorts of things. Like there's so many questions unanswered. What we do know is that eating beans puts nitrogen back in the soil <laughs> and anyone can grow beans uh, so long as they have some dirt. We don't want people to have IP and ownership over our proteins necessarily. And so it's it's just very, it's very interesting. And we've seen the, the, the ways this has kind of shifted how people talk about lots of things like I've noticed my tofu from the store is now like it calls itself like a natural plant-based protein because you know they're trying to compete I suppose with Beyond Meat or or Impossible Meat in the supermarket so they're using trying to replicate the language when it's like tofu has been around for thousand a thousand years so it's it's an interesting it's an interesting moment. And I suppose your critique would extend to just agribusiness that is farming grains and beans and and vegetables and fruits too you know like there's still the labor issues there's still the mono cropping there's the land use issues and water and all of those things so so really it's about kind of maintaining that understanding and awareness of what what the issues are around food and I don't know. I'm just I, I'm not trying to put wor words in your mouth, but I'm just trying to understand, like, what's significant about like, why does it matter if we keep that consciousness around not eating meat? Because it maybe it can extend to other things that we're eating, too, and trying to have oh, that absolutely. relationship. Yeah. I mean, for me, not eating meat is 100 percent related to trying to support farmers who aren't letting their workers pluck lettuce in 120 degree heat. The food system is just so rife with poor labor conditions, poor ecological practices. And for me, not eating meat has always been part of rejecting that as well. It's never been just, I don't eat meat. La-di-da, I wipe my hands of the problems with the lettuce and the grains, etc. I mean, right now, we there's so much cashew cheese on the market. There has to be also vows on on the makers of vegan cheese cheeses websites because the conditions for cashew harvesting are so dire in a lot of places using prison labor uh, there's toxins on the sh the skins that burn the hands of people who are shelling the cashews and so it's just about trying to have this more holistic understanding of how the food system has been shaped to be destructive at, at such a level that you can't even know that a cashew, <laughs> you know, I think it's 
three percent of cashews are are fair trade certified that one can can get. And so you have to make a very, very conscious effort, even with a nut. And so for me, not eating meat is is like a first step towards thinking about all of these issues that happen in the food system and how can you change your behaviors to adjust to them and 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 being understanding when things come along that problem that seem too good to be true like oh we're just going to replace all the hamburgers with a soy burger you know asking questions about what does that really mean what are what are the real implications of that and i think that because there aren't a lot of vegetarian or vegan food writers there are more now but i think a lot of the questions just weren't being asked of these companies when they were launching because people were like, well, of course, I don't want to eat a quinoa burger. I want to eat a veggie burger that like a burger that tastes like meat, but isn't meat. And they didn't ask questions about what's the land use? What's what's the labor conditions? Who's profiting from this? Is this going to be like a copyrighted product that or, it, you know, what are the proprietary product actually? Yeah, in in, in an impossible burger, heme that makes it bleed. We don't really know how that's really produced and and there's a lot of like proprietary technology going on in food tech that's supposed to be for the future and is plant-based but these are just opaque processes it's it's more opaque than producing cheese from from cow milk we know what that process is but when you're talking about your proprietary process for extracting whey and and turning it into you know ice cream but you don't want to tell anyone because you you need to make money off of it like these are foods we're eating these aren't iphones you know it, it's it's something different it's not the same as all the technology we're accustomed to interacting with every day my guest is alicia kennedy her new book is no meat required the cultural history and culinary future of plant-based eating we'll return to our conversation after a short break You're listening to Earth Eats. I'm Kate Young. Let's return to our conversation with Alicia Kennedy, author of the book No Meat Required, The Cultural History and Culinary Future of Plant-Based Eating. You don't really shy away from pointing out that meat eating, in spite of this kind of mainstreaming of, of vegan and vegetarian diets, it's it's increasing. It's not decreasing. And what do you make of that? And how do you how do you hang on to hope about a larger <laughs> portion of the global population moving towards more sustainable eating practices, even when you don't really see any evidence of that on a large scale? I want to have hope. I want to see behavior change. I think it takes a lot of cultural momentum to change behavior around something so ingrained as meat eating, something so ingrained not just in a U.S. culture, but in human culture as a symbol of affluence and wealth and, and status. So yes, it, it's a, it's we have to change that relationship. And I, I keep saying to folks, it's like, you can still eat meat. And, and even in my concluding chapter, I'm saying the conscientious omnivore is the best friend in the fight against industrial animal agriculture because the person who takes a lot of pleasure and takes a lot of value and and consideration when they do consume animals, that's who you would want on your side, I would think, because what's really the big, big problem is the scale at which we are producing beef and, and dairy, mostly, as well as chicken in the United States. The behavior changes are very slow to come because it's just very slow to change behavior, and it hasn't been made to seem, I don't want to say urgent enough, because I do think it's been made clear that this is quite an urgent situation, climate change, and, and the food system's role in it. But I do believe it hasn't been made enticing enough from a food standpoint. It hasn't been made easy enough in terms of restaurant options. There was a new study out recently that said people will order vegan and vegetarian options more readily if they are not marked on a menu. So hopefully that's something we can learn from is to just not tell people. And then they'll they'll look at a, a, a wrap or a sandwich on a menu and they'll be like, oh, that sounds good. And they won't even notice that it has no meat or dairy in it. But it's a very hard kind of struggle. And it's especially because this style of eating or this decision that folks make is still seen as very strange and weird and antagonizing. 
I do have some hope that we're we're learning what will trigger behavior change around food, even though it's very slow going. I think that the more folks who are talking about it, and there are great writers now at big outlets, like I think of Ali Francis at Bon Appetit doing a lot of work on on vegetarian kind of psychology and like why people are in, are less inclined to eat meat or why they're more inclined to return to eating meat. And so I think once people start to have these conversations more openly, because a lot of food media for a long time was very l focused on, well, you know, there will be lab meat in the future. And so we don't have to really worry about this. And here's your steak on a grill. It's OK. But I think that we're kind of coming to the point where we're not saying that anymore. And I've seen the Washington Post and Eater and all these places talk now about I'm sick of seeing impossible burgers on menus, like bring back the the real veggie burgers. And so there are some adjustments. It's just I think we've learned from this past moment of kind of corporate disruption, <laughs> let's say, of vegetarian and vegan food that it doesn't work in the end. And what people really want is good food. And if we can figure out how to make more good food that doesn't have meat in it, then then that's the best opportunity we have. It's just got to be that cultural conversation shifting and it has to be more people talking about it. And it's happening, but it's not happening fast enough for sure. Mm -hmm. So you also don't shy away from the whiteness that's been associated with the vegan and vegetarian eating, at least in the U.S., as we were talking about earlier. Like it is that is a U.S. phenomenon. <laughs> Could we talk about some of the criticisms of, of veganism as elitist or even racist or kind of insensitive to cultural traditions that include meat? It's hard because I have a lot of respect, of course, for the animal rights movement. A lot of time they have missed the mark in terms of labor and in terms of, of respect for cultural traditions. I think that that is, that is slowly shifting. I do think that the narrative around all vegetarians and vegans being white has been one that was kind of forged in order to make it seem unappealing or uninviting. In one of my first restaurant pieces for The Village Voice, I went up to Eastchester in the Bronx to go to a place, uh, a vegan bodega, and they were making Ital food, which is the Rastafarian tradition from Jamaica. And in the freezer case, they had soy-based shrimps that were made by a Chinatown company. So it was always funny to me to hear people say, oh, you know, being vegan is, is a white thing, because I'm like, but these are developed by a Chinese company in Chinatown, and now they're sold in the Bronx at a Jamaican grocery store. So I don't really know where you're coming from with this. But the the movement itself, like the people who are the faces and the most out there about it, have hit, been white and have been a little bit less embracing of the significance of cultural traditions and, and, and that sort of thing. And I think we're seeing a lot of change. There's, you know, the Food Empowerment Project is a really great organization that is vegan, but also really, really focused on farm worker rights. And it's also very, very focused on creating different cultural based vegan food recipes. Now we're also seeing big changes in terms of the cookbooks being published that are vegan, too. And so I think that it's going to get harder and harder for people to latch on to that stale narrative of elitism and whiteness around vegan and vegetarian food, because, you know, the last two years of the James Beard Awards, the vegetable focused cookbook award has gone to the Korean vegan and then it went to the vegan Chinese kitchen. And just this year, we've had Plentiful by Danae Moore, which is Jamaican vegan food, vegan barbecue by Terry Sargent, who he's like a great pit master in Georgia, Black Creek and Vegan came out this year too like the vegan cookbooks are starting to really really reflect the world and i think that it, this this narrative is going to change but it has been the dominant narrative because it's been useful for folks who who want to keep vegan and vegetarian diets from seeming for seeming exclusive but it's also you know it's just been a product of who's allowed to speak the loudest and be the most visible and that's the, that's something we're seeing change broadly and and that's also going to change the face of, of vegan food for sure now the vegan and vegetarian food has become almost ubiquitous now that more people understand its diversity and potential as a way of being more environmentally friendly on a daily basis the movement must grapple with its future. And who owns it? Who will steer it? 
Historically, this has been the realm of counterculture folks, hippies, anarchists, punks, chefs interested in alternatives to animal agriculture. But the world of tech and venture capital is now sinking its proprietary teeth in, and there hasn't been much of a fight against this wave, which suggests the future of food isn't based on what grows and what flows, but on what can be cultivated in a laboratory and make a few people very rich, all under the guise of saving the planet. That's great. Thank you. I think those are really, I, I like that because it really has a lot of what you touch on in the book is sort of in there. In that little yes. No, I realized just now reading it, I was like, oh, that's the whole book. <laughs> <laughs> Could you share your thoughts about the future of food? I mean, you already have touched on this a little bit. You've been asked to comment on food tech and things like Impossible Burgers and lab-grown meat, even though this isn't the way that you eat. I wondered if you could just reflect a little bit about the, the future of food as, as you see it. <laughs> when people ask me, like, how, how do we feed, you know, 10 billion people, I'm always trying to say, we have to think on a smaller scale and we have to think regionally and what's going to best serve the regional ecosystem, the regional population, the regional labor force. It's different when you think of what is needed on a smaller scale versus trying to speak for everybody. And I think that the problem in a lot of our food system conversations has been a desire to speak for everybody and make it a solution that works for everybody everywhere on the whole planet. And that's never going to be the case because food means different things to different people. It means different things in different climates. It means different things under different political and economic conditions what a food system is going to look like that serves a place like Puerto Rico best, it's going to look different than a food system that serves the Northeast of the United States or the Midwest of the United States the best. And so the conversation has to get more granular. And I think that there's a, there's a big kind of resistance to that. There's a, there's a real attachment, especially in the United States, to thinking that there's going to be a one-size-fits-all future of food and that simply is impossible because it's that there's not a one size fits all soil. There's not a one size fits all terroir. There, it's just not going to happen. And so, for me, I think in as you know, I wrote this book, and it's sort of like my manifesto of the first ten years of my career in food. And for the future, I, I want to think more specifically and talk more specifically, and sort of refuse to have the the have a one size fits all conversation and pretend that things are going to look the same for everybody because they're not. While there are big decisions we can make on bigger scales, yes, like reducing meat by a ton, stopping industrial animal agriculture, these sorts of things, I think that the other other decisions need to be made on on smaller regional levels to best serve distinct populations. One of the things that I really appreciated about your approach in this book and even in a book that is about not eating meat, I feel like there was some complicated thinking through like the the example of the lionfish and how, okay, maybe eating lionfish in this particular context, in this particular place, in this time is something that makes sense for the planet. And then just kind of your internal struggles about that. I thought that was a that was really interesting. And I think we need more of that. <laughs> That's what I'm trying. I hope that it kind of inspires more of that. Because for me, that was, you know, it was, am I choosing animal life? Or am I choosing the planet? Usually, that seems like such an easy decision. And in this case, with an invasive species, it's not. And it, it, it's, it things are that complicated and they are that nuanced all the time and so i think if if we can have adapt our our food conversations to be on that level i i think that's where we can start to push the real behavioral change yeah and i think that in terms of having conversations with people who aren't vegetarian or aren't vegan like having that more sort of nuanced approach of just really like it's not a it's not a black and white there are ways to approach eating that could include some meat consumption but can still have a conscious approach to to the planet absolutely yeah and i hope i hope we have more of those conversations <laughs> to conclude our conversation with alicia kennedy i asked her to read another passage from her book 
I write about food because I love to look at it, smell it, cook it, share it. I especially love to do these things with fruits and vegetables and beans. I love to show people what can be done, what's possible without involving animals for their flesh or their milk, their eggs. Right now, I probably sound like one of the food writers I don't like, one of those food writers who turned a generation off ever thinking too deeply about what they ate, because then a box of Kraft mac and cheese for comfort after a long day would be a sacrilege. Those food writers, the dreadful ones, seem to think that going to pluck an apple from their orchard and cook eggs from their hens over a wood fire is a normal way of eating. Or is this just parody? I know I don't eat in a normal way which is a product of a lot of luck and privilege. But that's why I want to advocate for a world where luck and privilege have no role in whether one's food is fresh, nutritious, culturally appropriate, and accessible. That's the future of food I want. That was Alicia Kennedy reading from her book, No Meat Required, The Cultural History and Culinary Future of Plant-Based Eating. Find links on our website, eartheats.org. That's it for our show. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Earth Eats team includes Violet Barron, Aabon Binder, Alexis Carvajal, Alex Chambers, Mark Chilla, Toby Foster, Daniela Richardson, Samantha Schemenauer, Peyton Whaley, and Harvest Public Media. Special thanks this week to Bev Rivero at Beacon Press and to Alicia Kennedy. Earth Eats is produced and edited by me, Kate Young. Our theme music is composed by Aaron Toby and performed by Aaron and Matt Toby. Additional music on the show comes to us from Universal Production Music. Our executive producer is Eric Bolstridge. Mm-hmm.